Um, I know all of you probably came to see me today, right? <laughs> Not really. Um, I know who you came to see, so let me get on with our introduction. I'm excited to introduce to you our inspirational speaker today. To me, she is one of the most beautiful women I've ever met, inside and out. She was 12 years old when she became the victim of a terrifying and bizarre four-year brainwashing ordeal. Her captor maintained such a convincing and threatening hold on her that even after she returned home from the initial kidnapping, she continued to secretly meet him and was eventually taken from her home a second time. Her story is one of survival, triumph, determination, and unending hope. Since the age of seven, Jan has turned most of her time and attention in recent years to film and television roles. She's played the funny, recurring, regular Nurse Louise on the popular television ser series Everwood. Most recently, Jan finished filming a guest star role where she played the mother of a 12-year-old kidnapped boy on Criminal Minds. She also starred in Iron Man 3 as the newsroom producer and played the funny but poignant exercising obsessed cougar mom in the grand jury award winning film Coyote. Jan is very passionate about helping families and victims, and you'll see that today, of abuse and brainwashing to find hope and power in taking back their lives. She shares her story of abduction as a 12-year-old girl in the book Stolen Innocence, the Jan Broberg story, written by her mother, Mary Ann Broberg. Jan is a popular speaker and a spokeswoman for Child Shield USA. Her message is to inform, inspire, and ignite the human spirit, to stand as a voice and an action for change, hope, prevention, and healing. Please help me in welcoming Jan Broberg. <laughs> Well, she made me cry already, which isn't anything new to most of you who've ever heard me speak before. I'm an emotional person. I'm an actress, and, I, and I'm, this isn't an act. <laughs> I actually am very passionate about bringing this story and many stories to light so that we can make a change, so that we will be able to live in a world where every person, this is my goal, is that every human being on the planet no matter what your age is, has or claims or reclaims their happy childhood. Whether you do it at 90 or you get it when you're young, it doesn't matter. I just want people to know that they can live and be fully self-expressed, that they can heal, and that there is great possibility in their own life and what they can do even from the difficult experiences that they may have come from to share with others to make a difference in the lives of others and in their own life. I feel so lucky that this uh, little girl, Jan Broberg, um, had this wonderful family. When I was, when I was um, getting ready to speak at my very first public it was for school teachers and school counselors all across the state of Utah. It was, there was going to be like a thousand people there, and I got asked to speak. And I had just been watching the news when Elizabeth Smart was found, and I was preparing. I was literally preparing for that day. And a woman came on the television, and this is what, what she said to the newscaster. She, she folded her arms, and they were saying, isn't it wonderful? Elizabeth Smart's been found. Did you hear the news? And people were so happy for her family and for her, and it's amazing, and we're so glad she's alive. And then this woman, I had the TV on while I was at my computer preparing for this conference, the very first one I was going to speak at. And a woman came on, she crossed her arms, and this is what she said, well, I think it is just disgusting. Here she is, right under our noses. Why didn't she run into the street and start screaming? Or pick up a phone and call someone, call home? Didn't she see the signs, the posters? Didn't she realize how much time and money we were all spending trying to find her? I stopped typing for a moment. 
I was so stunned. I was already in a little bit of PTSD that day. And through, throughout, my FBI agent called me. I had family and friends from all around the United States calling me, are you okay, are you okay? I said, I'm okay, I'm shaking a little bit like I am today because I so want to make an impact on you. I want what I say to make a difference in your life. And I said, I'm okay. I said, but I just heard a woman on the news and this is what she said. I said, I realize I have something to say because I know why Elizabeth Smart did not run in the street and start screaming. I know why she never lifted the veil and said, hi, it's me. Not only do I know her story, but I know the story of thousands and thousands, millions even, of children, adults now, many who sit in this room, who have gone through some kind of sexual assault, rape, or abuse. And they have that as a secret, as their shame, as something that they don't tell. And so when I heard this, and I so wanted to say the right things at that very first conference, I knew that what I really wanted to concentrate on was that we have started. We have started on the journey to unmask the secrets of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. But the public as a whole is still, even though I've been doing this now for a number of years, grossly uneducated on the long-term effects of brainwashing and mind control on children and adults. Anyone that keeps a lethal secret, anyone that does not stand up and say, it's this person, they live in my house, they're in my congregation, it's this person, they're in the public eye. This person has created harm and in secret holds that instead of standing up and having a voice. You're still brainwashed. You're still holding on to a secret. And I want to empower you to stand up, to make the change, because it is almost never a scary stranger. Now, Elizabeth Smart got a ton of media attention, right? Which is wonderful, because she can do something with that. But let me tell you about my kidnapper, my sexual abuser, my person, my perpetrator. In the 1970s, we were what? Ditto machines, right? No PCs, no fax machines, no video cameras, no phones, no Oprah. Well, the day that that woman said that on on national TV about Elizabeth Smart. I wrote to Oprah almost immediately. I was like, oh my gosh, nobody realizes why victims stay quiet for years and years and years and sometimes never tell. They don't know. And I wanted to, I wanted to tell my story. I knew that I needed to tell my story. So here we are. That's me. I'm, I, I look, I'm the one back behind my youngest sister's in front. My next sister, who's two years younger than me, Karen, is over there on the on that side, and then I'm the one peeking out from behind Susan. I was tiny. I was a tiny little thing. When I was 12, I looked like I was maybe 8. I didn't hit puberty till I was 18. So all of this happened when I was just a tiny little prepubescent little girl. And in this day and age, here's me and my dad in, oops, in 1972 at a daddy-daughter date. I was very close to my, my family, my sisters, my dad. Um, here's Easter morning with our new Easter bunny, Snitcher. Um, and then a new family moved into our neighborhood. Uh, the mom, Gail, was a dear friend of my mom's, became very good friends with her. First time I remember meeting the Birchtold family was at church. That's where I met them. They had a son who was my age and then stepping down a son Karen's age, a son Susan's age, and then another son, and a little brand new baby girl, Jerry, Jimmy, Joey, Jeff, and Jill. These were all the right, I guess all of the right things came together. I was the perfect target. Um, I had strong moral convictions. I was a pe pleaser, a peacemaker. I was obedient, outgoing, and bubbly. I had naive, trusting parents who I adore, who loved everybody, 
there was no judgment in our house. We were, and we met this family at church, and they were wonderful. So in 1972, when we really look back at that time, my parents didn't know what a pedophile was when they were asked about this man, this family man, married with five children, who disappeared with Jan Broberg at age 12 in 1974. There were no child abuse laws. There were tentative steps being taken to put child abuse laws in place, but there were none. There were abuse laws against animals, and we had gone through the civil rights movement, but there were no child abuse laws for children. This is something new. So the fact that we have had those things in place means that we can, we can change what is happening if we are brave and we stand up, and sometimes it breaks up families and people don't believe you and I know how hard that can be but we have to start doing something about it we can't sweep it under the rug we can't just move on and say well at least they won't do that to my child or to me again because there's a whole string of other children that'll be the victims he was a respected business owner there he is right there pictures in the paper had a wonderful furniture store in town he was charismatic. He was a religious leader in my church. He was a business owner, service-oriented, sensitive, could talk to anyone, related well to women and men. Very sincere, affable, and intelligent. He didn't look like a scary stranger because he wasn't a scary stranger. He didn't look anything like Elizabeth Smart's kidnapper. He looked like the guy next door. He looked like my second father after two years of having a relationship with this family. He said he would do anything for me, and he would. I wrote that in my diary. I kept a little diary that my dad gave me for about a year before the kidnapping happened. And it's full of entries about doing things with the Birchtold family. That was something I said about him. He said he'd do anything for me. He would, too. It was like my second father. We fit his profile, and from the very beginning, he knew when he first saw me singing a little song at church, that was, the, that was the object of his desire. We were just gullible enough. We were just compassionate enough. He knew that he could twist and manipulate every member of my family, which he did, as well as the members of our congregation and our community. After the first kidnapping, when I was returned by the FBI, I cannot tell you how many people in our neighborhood and in our congregation said, well, don't press charges. He didn't hurt her. I'm telling you, this does not surprise me. And even in 2017, I am telling you, that is happening. I've seen it in your papers recently. So, because I don't have a ton of time, I'm going to go quickly through some of these. So as I said, when I went, oh, I haven't told you this part, but he's like a second father to me. He would give us all gifts, and he would do nice things for us. He, he fixed our bedroom downstairs. My three sis, my, the three of us girls had one great big gigantic bedroom, and he put up walls so we could all have our own bedroom, putting my bedroom at the very end of the house where there were two windows and that became where he entered into my bedroom and helped me out the window the second time, the second kidnapping. So I've kind of given you a little synopsis of who, who, who are these people? Well, they, they, they live right here. They're not scary strangers. There were 750,000 missing children reported to the FBI last year in the United States. Seven, did, I, did, I, did you get the number? Did it land? 750,000 children went missing in the United States of America. How many of their names do you know? None. 115 of the 750,000 missing children were taken by a stranger, 115. 
if this does not startle and alarm you, it should. So there are lots of ways that a person can begin to dupe you or manipulate you or pull the wool over your eyes. They find things that you and your children are interested in. They become your best friends. I loved horses. So one day he showed up at the back door after becoming one of our best friends. I mean, these people were our very, very dearest friends. We did many trips together. We had been, I mean, we'd done many things together. And he showed up at the back door and said, hey, I want to take Jan horseback riding out at the ranch. We'd been there before in American Falls. This is Idaho. Pocatello, Idaho is where I grew up. So I begged my mom, oh, yeah, yeah, I want to go. I let me go. Well, it's a school night. I don't think you should go. Anyway, I kept begging, and pretty soon she said, well, okay, but you have to be back before dark, and, and you got to go to your piano lesson first. Of course, he knew when my piano lesson was. He was that close to our family. He knew. He goes, oh, I'll just pick her up from her piano lesson. Okay. So he picked me up from my piano lesson to go horseback riding. October 17th, 1974. As we started out to the ranch to go horseback riding, he handed me my allergy pill. Of course, I didn't know the difference, but he had obviously filled it with a sleeping medication because when I woke up, several hours later, I was in the back of a moving motorhome, strapped to the bed with a little box playing in my ear. Now, this is the early 70s. All of this time has been spent in the early 70s when all of the science fiction movies were really popular. He'd taken all of us, his kids and me and my sisters, to see all the science fiction movies and just take, would take us on outings all the time. So I had seen, you know, E.T. and I had seen other <laughs> alien-based movies. And when I woke up in the back of that motorhome with this little box, intercom box, playing in my ear in this high-pitched monotone voice, I immediately thought that I had been taken by some kind of a UFO. And it might sound absolutely insanely crazy to you, but I am telling you, if you isolate a person, control their information, lay all of the seeds for grooming, you can literally have somebody wake up strapped to a bed and have them believe that they were taken by some other entity. I hadn't seen him yet. I had no idea if I was all, I thought I was all alone. So I'm going to play you the trailer from the documentary in just a minute, and it'll give you a little bit better visual picture of what that was like. When I speak at con uh, lots of different um, conferences and places that I go, they ask me, well, how long did it take for you to be brainwashed? And I said, well, at that point, all of those seeds and everything that had happened had already been laid. All the grooming was done. When I woke up to that voice, that high-pitched, eerie voice, it took, what, five seconds. So in my case, this is a bizarre story, but the reason why it's so important is because there are common things that anyone with a lethal secret has had some piece of brainwashing or mind manipulation, something that keeps you quiet. That you, why you don't stand up and scream and yell and, and press charges and put people in jail. And most of the time, it's because it's somebody that the child knows, loves, trusts. If I were to have people raise their hand, I just spoke with the Utah Attorney General um, for this, this group, the uh, Tim Ballard's group, the Operation Underground Railroad. I spoke with the Utah Attorney General recently when their documentary came out. And um, he kept saying, you have to understand that what Jan is saying applies to like five out of ten children. Four out of every ten boys before the age of 18 are sexually assaulted. Six out of every ten girls are sexually assaulted or raped before the age of 18 in our country. If I were to have you raise your hands, I can tell you the numbers would be true. I'm not going to ask you to do that because it's up to you when you decide to share your story. But I'm telling you, in this room, those numbers would be true. 
I have never been in a room where that was not the truth. So if I were to say, do you know someone close to you that's had some kind of uh, experience like this? Let's say it's not you, but somebody close to you. Raise your hand. Do you know somebody close to you that has been through something like this? Or close, you know, in your, in your family, community, congregation, somebody? Look at all the hands. It's just a huge number of people. They don't have dancing bears in India anymore because we had awareness that having dancing bears is not a good idea for the bears. And people got excited about trying to end that. And they helped the people find other ways of living their lives and having a different profession. And there are no more dancing bears in India. I want there to be no more sexually assaulted children in America or around the world. Is this possible? <laughs> it really has to get on the forefront of our what? Consciousness. This is not a small problem. It's just because you don't know who else around you has gone through this. You don't know. But I guarantee you, if you don't know someone now, you will in 10 years, in two years. So we look at the papers. We look at the, we look at, you know, a police officer who's charged with aggregated kidnapping. This is the local paper. We look at the Deseret News. Why are girls and boys taking nude selfies? Most of the time it's because they've been through something already and they're trying to figure out how to fit in or how to be accepted or how to feel good. It isn't because they're bad, it's because almost always, every single time I go and speak to people that have been in the area of, you know, people that cut themselves or anorexia or bulimia or, or I can tell you a million things. And all of them, almost always, drug addiction, alcoholism, all of it, you come down to the actual person. And almost all of them suffered through some kind of a sexual break, a sexual assault of some kind. It messes children up. Now, I feel lucky that I had two parents and a family that were there for me from the time I was born. I was not assaulted or hurt by my family. Those of you in this audience who were, let me just tell you, I am here as a resource to give you a way to come out of that. I don't know if I, I didn't experience that, so I have to be totally honest. I don't know what that would be like, but I do feel like I have some resources that I have found throughout my life that have literally helped me take that off, make a choice to put it over there, what I call my victim cloak. I don't live my life that way. I don't feel that way. I, I hesitate using the word a lot of times, but I can look at it. It's like taking this and setting it over there on the chair and I can see what happened to me and I know the, the effects that it had on my life, but I also can learn from it and I can share it and I can empower and help other people with it. It does not control my life. That's the, where I'm at. And some of the things that I have done throughout my life to get to that place I would freely share with anyone that wants to know. You just come and talk to me. So all of these, all of these brainwashing techniques are being used. I wake up on and off being drugged in the back of the motorhome, and, and I'm instructed to go to the front of the motorhome. The partition has been removed that's been there for the last several days, and I would go and they would say these little instructions, you have food, and you can go to the bathroom, and then lay back down, and then I'd wake up and I'd be strapped again, and I was in and out of a very, very deep induced sleep. But at this point, I'm unstrapped. I'm allowed to go to the front of the motorhome, and as I walk to the front of the motorhome, there on the bed, covered in blood, is B. That's what we called him. We called him B. And I think he's dead. And I'm immediately shaking him and crying, wake up, wake up, you've got to wake up. We've been taken, you've got to wake up. I mean, this guy is like my second father. He comes to, best actor I ever worked with, comes to and says, Dolly, he called me Dolly, Dolly, what happened? 
where are we? We were going out to go horseback riding when all of a sudden I saw a white light came in, coming out of the sky and this car, car just went out of control and I, I think we wrecked and oh my gosh, what? And he's got blood all over him. And so I proceed to tell him the story that we've both been taken by a UFO. Not having any idea what was going to happen from there, the whole story unfolds. You'll have to come see the documentary to see how extensive the story and the brainwashing really was. But basically, he used those aliens, which I have tapes in the documentary from the FBI. I mean, it's amazing what my wonderful FBI agent saved in a little banker's box. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. The tapes that he had created. And then another woman came forward seeing our little documentary site when we were just getting started and raising money and then do a little bit and then raise some more money and do a little more and trying to get this thing made while I, when I was living in Los Angeles, that's where I've been for the last seven and a half years. Um, and she contacted the documentary and said, hi, my name is, and we knew her name from a police report, I'm the little girl who put him in jail. I was like, oh my gosh, this is Heidi. So I'm calling and I'm talking to her and we're bawling on the phone. And she had no idea that she knew my name because he had talked about me to her as a nine-year-old girl. So I was found the first time. I'm going to get back to this story. Here's all of this, you know, this is how manipulation works. Brainwashing continues. I get letters. All of this is in the documentary. And because I know I'm... I'm trying to hurry here, I won't go through all of it, but he would call me after the FBI brought me home. He would get in, I would go, I mean, call me as in, there were no cell phones in the 70s, call me as in, I would get a note from somebody I didn't really know at school, we called them hoods, <laughs> and they would hand me a note and it would say, go to this phone booth, you know, on Bonneville at four o'clock today, sit on the floor of the phone booth and the phone will ring, answer the phone, and I would, go, go home from school and say, Mom, I'm going on a bike ride, and at 4 o'clock I'd ride my bike and I'd go sit in the floor of the phone booth and the phone would ring and on the other end, it would either be him or it would be the alien voice. Da 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 da, female companion. That's how it talked to me. And give me instructions, what I was supposed to do next. Very extensive brainwashing. So what I find really fascinating is that through all of these times, even the two times when he actually came through my bedroom window, the one that he had put the wall up in that corner of the room, because he only spent 19 days in jail, and then he went to a mental hospital, and then he was out of there in about six months because he was so charming, and he was absolutely perfectly fine. So, this woman, back to Heidi. She says, I'm the one that put him in jail. And I had to break the news to Heidi. I had to say, oh, Heidi, that was amazing. I said, because we found five other women who were little girls and victims of his after my second kidnapping, which I haven't even told you about. That's coming. After the second kidnapping, he had started grooming Heidi in between the two kidnappings and her mother. Her mother, he was living in Salt Lake City. Her mother was a psychiatric nurse at the University of Utah. She wasn't dumb. He became her best friend and, her, and all the while trying to get to her nine-year-old daughter. So when I said to Heidi, yes, that's amazing what you did. After nine years at age 18, when she had told a friend at school she was going to kill herself, and the friend called her mom, and her mom came to her and said, you have to tell me what, what's, what's going on. What, what or why? Why would you want to kill yourself? Nine years she'd been being raped by her mother's best friend, my same guy. And this woman, I had to tell her, who now lives in Iowa, she said, I've never had any therapy. I really have kind of messed up my life. I said, no, your life got messed up for you. I said, but there is some things I want to share with you so that you can have your life, your happy childhood again. And I did. But then I had to tell her, yeah, he was convicted for rape of a child. You did a really brave thing. He spent one year in jail. You mean he's out? I said, he spent one year in jail. 
She couldn't get over it. She just started sobbing. She said, you're the only person that I've ever, I, I, I have never told anyone that he used those same brainwashing tapes on me. The 119 days that I had run away from home, I was in his apartment. She said, I knew no one would ever believe me. She said, I can't believe that you're this brave. He said, I don't care if anybody believes me. I know what happened, and I want other people to be spared. But I had to tell her. He spent one year in jail. Since my story and I've been out speaking, we've had five other women who were his victims come forward. And now I know of two before me that are not included in the five that I've just started conversations with. So the bravery that it takes to stand up, to do something, is what I'm asking for in this room. I don't ever want to have to tell somebody again. And I know some of you that have little kids, Steve Johnson. You don't want this to happen. You want to protect these kids. You have to stand up and do something. Join me in this movement. It's never a scary stranger. I mean, not never. 115 out of 750,000. Once in a while. Like, what is that? It's not even a 1%. We can't have any more dancing bears. It is truly the time. I want to just mention this, acting and emotional expression on stage became my only therapy. At age 16, I was doing a show, because I was in a theater camp at BYU. I don't know how my parents ever let me go. That was after I had been found the second time, after the second kidnapping. First kidnapping, let's see. Here's all these letters, and I have so much stuff. This is where he put me in this Catholic girls' school in Pasadena, California. They saved my life. Those nuns thought that we had escaped from Lebanon, that he was a CIA agent. I mean, the guy was cuckoo. That was the second kidnapping. That's where I lived there, and, and, and I was a wonderful Catholic girl. I love the Catholic church like I love my own. And I see the problems in them both and the many, many times that we have covered up. And we can't do that anymore. So I was found the second time on November 16, 1976. I'd been gone for almost four months. My whole demeanor had changed. The brainwashing was quite complete. I wasn't the happy, bubbly person that I had been before and that I am now. I was pretty much a robot. They did intercept some letters that he was trying to get to me. And then this happened. He was in jail with two arsonists who he hired to burn my father's flower shop to the ground. Not only was my father, who had been in the flower business for, at that point, probably, I don't know how many years, but he's been in that business all his life. He, was, he owned Atkins Flower Shop in Pocatello, Idaho for 40 years. He had these arsonists set a, a fire in the flower shop. It burned the entire building to the ground. Twelve businesses were destroyed. But I will never forget this one moment. If I can leave you with something like, what do we do? How do we help our kids? Let me just give you this one little personal story. We get the call. It's the middle of the night. The store is burning. I'm home. I'm still not really speaking to my dad because that was against the rules. But I'm home. I'm still brainwashed. I haven't told anybody what's really been happening to me for almost four years. But we get the call. We rush down to Main Street on Pocatello, Idaho. We see the flames. My dad is in the middle. My mom and my other little sister here and me and my other sister Karen here. And my dad just takes his arms, and he puts his arms around us. And he says, let it burn, let it burn, let it burn. 
Everything that matters to me is right here in my arms. There's a few things you don't forget in your life. That was one of them. If there's something you can do for your children, eat dinner together every night like we did before this happened. We talked around our dinner table with all of our gizmos anymore. It's hard. Make them put them away and talk. My parents listened to us as little kids. We knew we were loved no matter what. I hadn't really spoken to my dad for almost three years at this point because I wasn't allowed to talk to boys and I wasn't allowed to have a relationship with my father. That were, those were some of the rules that the aliens had. Because if I did, my little sister, who was also half alien and half human, and was going to have a baby to save the dying planet. planet this is a crazy story. You'll see it all. <laughs> was also like me. She was half alien and half human. My little sister, the one that, that was also petite. Not my middle sister, who was already, you know, becoming a woman. But my little sister. My mother's name is Mary. It was a familiar story in some ways. That's what people that, that manipulate you do. They take a familiar story and they, and they twist it. I thought I was supposed to have a child to save a dying planet. I was a little pre-puberty girl. But if I talked to my dad, they'd take my sister or they'd kill my dad because they had to get you know, all the people out of the way because I had this very important mission to fulfill. So they live in our neighborhoods. Ice Cream Miracle, which is not in my book, and I have 75 books here today. I don't want any of them. I'm not taking any of them home, so you have to come and get a book. I'm giving them away, and if you want to make a donation to something, you can make it to the foundation that I work for to bring other programs for kids. But they're here, and I want you to have one. Anybody that doesn't have a book, please come up and get one. This isn't in the story because I hadn't told my mom about this when she wrote this. We have a new manuscript that's going to be coming out. I'm going to New York on Thursday night. I'm looking for a publisher. If any of you have connections, let me know. I have a couple of meetings scheduled, but I could take more. Anybody have anybody in that world? Um, for the new manuscript, which will include all of this and the ice cream miracle that I'm going to tell you about to finish up the story, and then I'm going to show you the documentary uh, trailer. A boy at my theater camp, the one where I was planning to kill myself, but first, I was going to tell my little sister about the mission, and if she didn't want to do it, I'd kill her first, and then I'd kill me. I had to finish the play, though, because for me, I was very dedicated. I've been a dedicated actress since I was six years old. Had to finish the play before I actually did this. Well, a boy in line after a rehearsal bought my ice cream. I was standing, like, I, he, he liked me, and I kind of knew it, and I avoided him, and I never talked to him, and he paid for my ice cream. I went running back to my dorm room knowing that I was going to die or my dad would be dead or my sister would be taken because this thing happened. And I was so terrified. My mom calls, my dad calls every day. They called me two or three times a day. Wouldn't you, right? And I'm crying and my mom's like, what's wrong? And I said, oh, I'm just upset and there's just so many things and I just, I just can't, I don't know, I can't, I can't do everything, I can't handle everything. I mean, the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I think I'm saving some dying planet. And nobody knows. Nobody knows any, any of this. This is all a big secret. So she says, well, it's your, well, do you need us to come? I'm like, no, I have to finish the play. Come when the play is happening in like three days. Come and see the play when you come and pick me up. I said, but you've got to make sure that everybody's okay and safe. You've got to make really sure. She said, well, the dogs are running around. They're a little bit sick. I think I fed them some bad food. I'm just bawling. It's my fault. It's my fault. I thought the burning of the store building and the whole city block of Pocatello, that was my fault. That's all I could keep saying. It's my fault. It's my fault. Uh, I think I was almost 15 at that time, 14. And now the dogs are going to die because of me. I must have done something wrong, and I let that boy buy me the ice cream. I mean, this is how brainwashing works. This is why your kids aren't telling you. So anyway, she said, I think I fed him something. I said, well, I got to go. I have to go to play practice. <laughs> so I left, went back to the theater where all of my therapy, because I could, I could scream on stage and I could cry. I could be upset and, and I could be happy. I could play somebody else. 
It really was my hospital and my counselor's office. That's why I believe in the arts. That's why I'm back here to support the arts. I got done with play practice. I went back to my dorm room that night and my mom called again. I think the dogs are feeling a little better. She was so concerned. And I said, well, I've got to go to sleep. So I went to sleep. I cried myself to sleep. In the morning, she called again. The dogs are doing great. I said, the dogs didn't die? No, the dogs are fine. Oh. Finished that phone conversation, and I had my first moment thinking, before I kill Susan and myself, I better make sure this is real. I had that moment, that thought. And then the very next thought, which is what happens to a brainwashed person, the very next thought is, oh wait, uh, I, I'm just kidding. I know you can read my mind, and I'm going to do everything you tell me to do. And I, 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 it was just, it was just, I don't know where that came from. Don't, don't hurt anybody in my family. I'm going to do it. I'll, I'll do it. That's the second thought. I see people nodding their heads. You're with me. You've been there. You know. But over the course of the next two months, August and September, I would test the waters. I would talk to a boy when school started, and my big, big, and nothing would happen. Well, little did I know, he was already working on poor Heidi. He already had his next victim. He was already grooming her. Here came her next nine years. I didn't know. I didn't know I was supposed to do something. Now I know. I know better, and that's what I'm doing. That's why I'm here today. I have to do something. So he was losing interest in me enough that nothing happened. And I kept testing the waters and accepted a date to the homecoming dance, my first date ever. I thought if I can go to this dance and come home and nobody's dead or missing, I'll know. And that's exactly what happened. And then it all came out in pieces. I couldn't talk about the sexual assault and abuse easily at all. I told my sister and my best friend Caroline and a little bit as Caroline dragged it out of me. But over the course of the next few years, it all came out. I thought I had done something wrong. And at that time, I luckily had a very tender-hearted bishop who practically crawled across the table to grab me and hug me. I'd say, no, 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 no. You didn't do anything wrong. I know not all of you have had that experience. I've talked to a lot of women who have not had that experience. I'm sorry. So he was, uh, he spent 19 days in jail. He was in a mental institution. The second time he also went to a mental hospital and then he was out. And obviously you've heard all the other victims. So my FBI agent, Pete Welsh, is who's been interviewed on our documentary. He's retired now. He uses my story to teach other, other FBI agents and, and people in universities profiling. He uses my case. Um, but he did all those things, kidnapping, arson, impersonation. He impersonated a CIA agent and served a total of 19 days in jail. Well, we got the story, and we hope that we can take it forward, maybe create a 10-part series a docu-series or a television series as well as getting the manuscript and the story out there so that we can actually stand up and do what my mission statement is to inform, create awareness first of all, that's what we're doing here today, and then to inspire. There is hope, there is healing. We don't have to have any more dancing bears. And how we do that is we ignite a movement that it is never a scary stranger and we have to get honest and we have to do the hard things. But if we do, I believe we really can bring back people's happy childhoods. So I, I again, I'll go into all of these other things at a different time. Um, okay, there's my mom, here's the book, it's up here. I wanna go to the documentary. <laughs> uh, 
uh, show you the trailer and let you know of a few things that are coming up. So who I am today also is I just came back from Los Angeles and I've moved back because I'm the new executive director of the brand new theater company and theater that's out in in Ivan's, you know where Kayenta is? There's a brand new theater building out there, which I had no idea was there. And over the holidays, happened to run into the right people who said, hey, you should come out uh, back home and, and put this together. And I said, well, I do love the arts and I do know how they save lives, how the arts saves lives, both sides, in the audience and on stage as we reach understanding of our human experience. And I said, I'd love to do that, I'm ready. So I still, I go back and forth. I just filmed something for American Crime Story, playing the mother of a murdered child this time. I, I, it's funny, to play the mother of this boy who had been kidnapped and had been missing for three years on Criminal Minds, I was like, oh my word, it is like my whole life has gone full circle. It was so, it was just so weird and empowering and amazing. I can't even tell you. How do I get to my, where's my girl? How do I get to my um, trailer? Because these guys have to get out of here and I gotta be done. Ah, it's already 104, I'm sorry. Um, how do I find it? <laughs> it was here. I just, it's only a minute long, so we're almost done. <laughs> uh, there it is, you did it. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we? Uh, Oh, I see, okay. All right, so here we go. So Forever Be is the name of the documentary. The new manuscript, the new book is called Abducted in Plain Sight, and it's called Forever Be. We have won uh, a couple of, of awards in the couple of festivals that we've been in, and it's coming to Doc Utah on September 5th at 4.20 and on September 7th at 7.15, and they both are being shown over in the Eccles um, at the on the university campus, so that's where you can go and, and check it out there. We also are having um, there's our awards in, from Mammoth Lake. There's my filmmakers, um, and we got written up a whole bunch of times. It is jaw dropping story, and they did a fantastic job. I have award winning Emmy award winning editor award-winning director and just a wonderful team of people that I was able to, to assemble in Los Angeles and, and they've just been absolutely relentless in getting this done. Um, so let me play you the, the, the um, trailer. Oh, and I need to mention, there is also a pre-screening that we are having at the um, Corporate Alliance building, Silicon Way, everybody know where that is? It's on August 17th. You are invited, it's for media and parents, and there will be like a, a question and answer, a breakout session, and it's on August 17th at 5.30 p.m. We'll have, you know, to try to, to raise awareness, help parents, help people, and the media will be invited to that one before um, the actual, okay, how do I make it full screen? So it's not like this. Somebody help me. There you are. <laughs> uh, okay. You can dim the lights. <laughs> oh, pause. Wait, where's the sound? While she's doing that, can I just thank she was you? A beautiful can you go back to the beginning of it? I just want to thank you for letting me be the speaker today and for coming and listening and for what you do in the world to make a difference. I know that in your business lives and in, in your personal lives that, that the people here are truly remarkable people and I really am moved and I really am excited to be back home. And thank you so much. She was a beautiful little girl, very bright and very lively. That's his voice. And as she smiled, there were definite dimples in both cheeks. B was like a second father to me. I would have trusted him with anything. I knew how to investigate a kidnapping. I had no idea about pedophiles.
I did the worst thing I've ever done. If it hadn't been for me, that wouldn't have happened. People ask me, how long did it take for you to be brainwashed? I don't know, five seconds. Jan went with me voluntarily. They bring in aliens and mind watch. Does he still want you to marry him and all that? Robert Birchtold was acquitted of first degree kidnapping by reason of mental defect. I don't know how many people in this town have asked me, how did he get away with it? Oh, if you're laying a trap for me, I'll kill you. He didn't leave Jan alone. The result was her disappearance a second time. Thank you. Again, after we have our wonderful Tuacon performers perform, <laughs> will you please come up and get a book and, and uh, please just please come and talk to me. Thank you so much for letting me come. Oh, that's beautiful. How pretty, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>